Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, AGR Lite, Understanding Whole Farm Insurance for the Specialized, Diversified and Organic Farm. My name is Rich Myers. I'm the editor here at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is more commonly known as NCAT. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization. We have six regional headquarters across the country and we work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture and sustainable energy and sustainable communities. Um, today's webinar is being funded in part by the USDA Risk Management Agency or RMA and we're grateful to RMA for its funding and support of this webinar. Um, one of the sustainable agriculture programs that NCAT manages, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, which you might know better as ATRA, uh, provides publication, technical assistance through our telephone hotline and website, webinars, and other information to farmers and ranchers, educators, extension agents, and, and anyone else who's involved in sustainable agriculture across the country. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be on NCAT's ATRA webpage, which is www.atra.ncat.org. And ATRA is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, and we're grateful uh, for their support as well. Our presenter today, Jeff Shazinski, will be discussing whole farm insurance for small and medium sized diversified farms. Among other options, he'll be discussing the federally subsidized whole farm insurance product called Adjusted Gross Revenue Light, or AGR Light for short. And he will also be talking about the AGR Light Wizard, which is a software tool that Jeff helped to develop as part of a four year project also funded by the RMA. The examples uh, that Jeff will be using in today's webinar will be focused on the Raleigh RMA. Um, region and if you're not familiar with the areas where that is it's pretty much the uh, the north or I'm sorry the East Coast from around North Carolina to Maine but uh, so you, as you'll see the information he'll be discussing is applicable anywhere and as you're listening to today's webinar as you'll see on your screen you'll be able to type in any questions that you might have and I'll gather those up as the webinar is going on and sort them out and We'll have Jeff answer as many as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And please, uh, I'd like to say, don't be shy about asking questions if you have them. Um, the chances are that we won't be able to get to all of them during the webinar today, but we will get back to you via email um, in the days to come. In fact, uh, we always welcome your questions to ATRA. You're welcome to call our toll-free assistance line which is 1-800-346-9140. We also invite you to go to our website, once again, www.atra.incat.org, and click on the Ask an Ag Expert button to send us a question by email. And But don't worry about it if you didn't get that phone number uh, or the website there. They'll be on your screen at the end of the webinar. And we do respond to all the questions we get, and it's worth noting that this service is offered free of charge. And one last thing before we begin, I just want to let our viewers know that when the webinar ends, you'll see a short survey come up on your screen. And we'd like to ask you to take a few minutes to complete it. We appreciate the feedback. It helps make these webinars better. And now let me introduce our presenter, Jeff Shazinski. Jeff is an agricultural economist here at NCAT. He has expertise in a wide variety of areas, including organic and sustainable agriculture public policy, marketing and economics, transgenics and agriculture, organic horticulture, energy use in agriculture, uh, cooperative development, sustainable building, intercultural communications, and beekeeping. He has been past executive director of both the Big Hole River Foundation and Western Sustainable Agriculture Working Group and he currently serves on the Organizational Council of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Before moving to Montana in 1992, Jeff worked for Rutgers University and he started one of the first CSAs in, uh, in New Jersey. He's received graduate degrees in agricultural economics and political science, served in the Peace Corps in Belize, and worked many summers on his grandfather's dairy farm in Wisconsin. So anyway, I think it's time to get started, so let me turn things over to Jeff. Uh, thank you, Rich, and, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, 
Today I'm going to uh, cover a number of topics um, uh, about crop insurance and, and focus a little bit on um, the East Coast, uh, Raleigh to Maine, and uh, so some of the examples I'll use will hopefully will be pertinent to that. This is a beautiful picture, but unfortunately one of disaster because it's a flooded lettuce field, as you can see. And I know Vermont over the last well, last year had a hurricane uh, caused some of these kinds of problems. Again, these are our sponsors, and I want to thank again the Risk Management Agency, who has been a, a big sponsor for this project prior to this project, even in, in some of the software tools that we've developed. Uh, the overview, we're going to go, I'm going to quickly go through crop insurance broadly. It's a very complicated topic, but we'll cover a little bit. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about specialty and organic crops more in particular, and, and mostly I'm going to spend time with uh, AGR Light, and, uh, and I'm going to compare AGR Light, which is, a, as you will hear many times, the whole farm revenue insurance product, very different than crop-based uh, products. And we're going to have some examples. We're going to look at whole farm versus crop-based alternatives and whole farm versus NAP, which is non-insured protection, which is a, a program of um, a slightly different program, but kind of used a lot by uh, diverse farms and organic farms. And then I'm going to do a little demo of our wizard and obviously take some questions. Again, another beautiful but uh, picture, but uh, Pretty muddy lettuce there. Uh, so why insure crops? Uh, we got interested in this project uh, almost six years ago now. I keep thinking it's five now. I think it's almost six. Uh, because we were interested in how to provide good crop insurance for smaller to medium size, relatively diverse farms. Um, as we'll see, crop insurance is available quite well for commodity crops and people that produce large quantities, but for some of the diverse and smaller farms and organic farms, there's, there's many issues. Uh, but in general, crop insurance is about protecting um, farms from multiple perils that they're um, exposed to. And uh, here's a list of the, of the uh, coverage that uh, most uh, policies cover. Uh, I, I hope we have no volcanic eruptions on the East Coast, but uh, if you did, they would be covered, but uh, hopefully that won't happen. But uh, but that does happen in Hawaii, and actually uh, that's an issue in Hawaii. I've given a talk out there, luckily, and uh, volcanic eruption actually is very real in, in parts of Hawaii for crop and farmers. And then I'll talk about, and so that's generally, that's called multiple peril or yield. Uh, there are things that impact the yield of the production of the crop. And then you have revenue, which is slightly different and a little bit more new in the history of crop insurance, uh, and where you're talking about the unanticipated uh, increases and decreases in price uh, that are different from yield. But a farmer plants, and he doesn't know exactly what the price of his crop will be in the future. He has some ideas, but not for sure. And there has been dramatic changes, Luckily, of many crops of the upside lately, but uh, a lot of times they're on the downside. So there is a, a great risk in, uh, in, in price volatility. And then again, we'll spend a lot of time on the whole farm approach. Uh, this is this year. Unfortunately, I think there's even some added counties. I know I'm here in Montana. We added a few counties to this map just recently. Um, uh, we have been in wildfires and ex extremely drought uh, conditions throughout most of the country. Um, luckily, in the, the area which we're talking about today, the North Carolina up through here, this year anyway, uh, things have been um, fairly good, uh, which uh, is, is great. But unfortunately, last year, which is, uh, again, these are disaster incidents from last year, uh, you can see that the, the northeast, uh, the, the set east coast here coming up through North Carolina wasn't quite as well off. Uh, and that was, because, because, of course, because of the hurricanes and some, um, I believe there were some tornadoes possibly through there too, but I think mostly that's from uh, the hurricane. I'm always confusing which one it is now, but anyway. But so... In general, crop insurance is a great national benefit. Uh, it's, uh, 
uh, as, as everyone should know, crop insurances, uh, all crop insurances, the premiums are partially federally subsidized. It averages about 62% of the cost of the premium is paid for by uh, public dollars, tax dollars. Uh, it is also becoming a very expensive program and unfortunately I think with some of the extreme weathers we're seeing both last year and this year, um, becoming ever perhaps more there's been an estimate that over the next few years uh, next 10 years or so there could be as high as nine billion a year um, last year which was a record level of payouts or indemnity payments is what the crop insurance term is uh, we had a record of 11 billion dollars paid last year um, and again however there were premiums paid of 12 billion so the uh, the you know the we did cover ourselves this year it's open question yet but uh, some people have suggested I've heard in meetings and it's secondhand information so it's not uh, we don't know yet until the crop is harvested but we could have significant uh, losses and some people have set up to 22 billion dollars in losses which would be a very very big record um, and again uh, that's uh, what's been happening um, important to note again and we won't spend much time but uh, the four crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, and cotton, uh, uh, this is the total liability covered by crop insurance in 2012. You can see that corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, if you add those all up, it's something like 76, 77 percent of, of all of the, uh, uh, of the li total liability coverage is in those, in those four crops. So the, those crops, those individual crop policies are quite good and quite well utilized. We're going to be talking more about this 15% other down here, which is the whole farm revenue category. I also point out here, you can see that uh, there's revenue and yield insurance, as I referred to earlier, and you can see the dominance of yield insurance uh, with that. We can see that also on this slide. Uh, and get a little historic perspective. Revenue insurance didn't really become available until uh, 1996 and forward. And so you can see this middle part here is the revenue insurance and we've been increasing the use of revenue insurance and a somewhat stable use of APH or just pure yield insurance. Again, yield insurance just covers uh, multiple perils related to yield losses whereas revenue incorporates price volatility as well as yield. And then uh, group is just a, uh, there's different uh, county-based group projects which aren't used as much. And again, the other is where we're interested in. And, and I'm also interested in specialty crops. Um, and especially crops uh, are really just the what's ever not commodity crops, but uh, this is the actual USDA definition, fruits, vegetables, trees, dried fruits, even uh, flowers, which is floriculture. Uh, especially crop uh, use has been increasing. Uh, this is a kind of broad categories. Nursery, nurseries are, are part of crop insurance, vegetables, and, and AGR broadly. There's really two kinds of adjusted gross revenues, which are whole farm revenue policies, and one is AGR and AGR light. We're going to concentrate mostly on AGR light, and the major difference, there's some other subtle differences, but the major difference is the level of coverage AGR and, and availability. AGR is, uh, is coverage up to about $6 million in liability, whereas AGR like kind of maxes out at $2 million. And uh, AGR is, is in, only in a few counties, although a lot of the, uh, the East Coast has AGR available, um, AGR light also is limited but uh, much more available and again for it's generally for a smaller in terms of lease sales but there are limits to so specialty crop would be an alternative for let's say a, a very diverse farm or organic farm they could individually insure uh, either with yield or for available revenue insurance but um, there's limits to that first of all the the uh, specific crop insurance for let's say um, cabbage, for instance, are only in certain counties, and I'll show you some maps of those. Uh, the, um, there is some other pro products being developed. Um, um, uh, again, they're largely, especially crops, are largely limited to actual yield, historical only, not revenue, or dollar, which is somewhat similar. And then there's, uh, and again, for very specific crops. Uh, actual revenue history is a pretty new idea and pilot and it's only available for those few crops. But AGR Lite is a little bit more widely available and is a very different way to approach this. 
uh, one of the other problems with specialty crops is that there there's some restrictive uh, uh, yeah, restrictive elements to those uh, those policies uh, that aren't as restrictive in, in whole farm and AGR light. So um, this again the ape this is yield insurance of cranberries and and you can see well in part cranberries aren't produced all over the United States although in this uh, Raleigh region we do have cranberry production and it's where the major production growing but let's say somebody was enterprising and perhaps wanted to grow cranberries in some bog in Pennsylvania it wouldn't be available to them and so that's one of the again the limitations is is that uh, they're not always available you can give through a special program you can sometimes request to have a cranberry insurance policy in a county where it's not available but it's a rather uh, long and difficult process and you have to prove that you can do that in that area so there's limits to some of the things. Apples is another interesting case. Again, we grow apples here in Montana where I'm, but we cannot get crop insurance for it, even though we do grow apples and have historically. East Coast, uh, a lot of, again, the Raleigh region grows quite a bit of apples and there are policies available there. But again, there are some counties within the region where it's not available. And this is more, I think, most interesting one, uh, fresh market tomatoes, again, are highly limited. Again, there's a few spots in, our, in the region we're talking about today where you can get fresh market county-based, um, I mean, in, in certain counties, so you can get uh, fresh market uh, specialty crop insurance, but not a lot of places. And again, these are the major producing areas, so uh, it's part of the logic of why they're there. But just to contrast, again, this is field corn. I was telling how corn dominates crop insurance. Well, you can see, uh, even in Montana, which is not the best place, in my opinion, to grow a lot of corn, you can get corn insurance in many, many counties in Montana, and pretty much a lot of the United States. So, um, well, well, I'm not. I mean, in some sense, there's a, there we can certainly grow corn in a lot of different places. Uh, you can see the difference is that. For the commodity crops, there's a, a, a generally a greater availability of the insurance compared to a lot of specialty crops. And again, I was saying about the restrictions. This is a, a fresh market corn, not field corn, fresh market corn. And you can see there are some uh, some restrictions. Not too bad. You have to have history of growing it. Um, there's some restrictions on, on planting and interplanting. I'm never quite sure uh, agronomically why that's true. But um, th again, these can cause limits to coverage for specific crops. Um, and, and I know a lot of the, uh, the, the Raleigh region, the East Coast, is uh, a lot of organic farming out there. And organic has had a hard time somewhat with uh, crop insurance because there's generally, and not for all crops now, but for most of them, there's a premium surcharge. And they generally don't insure for the organic value of the crop. They uh, only insure for the uh, non-organic value. Uh, there's been some responses to, to this. Uh, there is what they call organic price elections, which allow at least for cotton, corn, soybeans, and processing tomatoes. Uh, now you can get uh, your crop uh, the yield protection and revenue protection for these at the higher organic value which is set by RMA and for last for this year that was a significant difference for instance for field corn but again it's still limited to those four crops and there's some then they've dropped the surcharge for, for some organic policies uh, figs lots of citruses uh, and pears fruits so again um, there is some response to this, but it's still rather limited. So again, I'm going to turn back to whole farm revenue because I think it's one of the best options, uh, not necessarily ideal, but one of the best options for the diversified farm uh, rather than insuring if available. Because again, it, it, it is insuring, it's very important to make the distinction here. It's insuring the revenue, the historic revenue of the farm, not a specific crop. It's um, I'm going to contrast it again with another thing that's often used by specialized diverse farms uh, called non-insured crop disaster assistance program which isn't even technically a crop insurance although it functions like that it's for disaster assistance for those crops that there isn't insurance available and also um, again you could still do individual policies for all of your crops but again it would depend if it's available in your in your county or in your area 
So AJLR, again, has the ability to do two crops that you might not be available either as individual policies uh, and, and um, where there is no null revenue or yield insurance available um, because it's doing the, rev the whole farm revenue. Uh, it, 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 it does insure commodities with premium prices because remember it is insuring the revenue of the farm therefore to the extent you're, you have premium prices for the goods you're saying that will be reflected, reflected in your historic revenue and therefore will be part of what you will be insuring. Your, and this is why it works very well and it's probably one of the better alternatives for organic farms because organic, again, the organic premiums that you may or may not be getting, but if you're getting organic premiums, that should be incorporated in your revenue. Therefore, since the premium and everything is based on your historic revenue, the organic value is, is essentially covered by the insurance. And again, that, that would apply for a variety of differences because sometimes you can get a higher price for certain kinds of apples and other kinds of apples. If you're under a whole farm, again, that value will be incorporated in your historic uh, thing. It, and it's same for quality losses because, again, it, the, the losses will be reflected in losses to your whole farm revenue. And this is one of the few, HL is one of the, also one of the few uh, products where it incorporates the value for your livestock products. Uh, there are some individual livestock products, but they are uh, different and, again, not available everywhere. And unfortunately, AGRLI itself is not available everywhere. It's still only in 38 states, and these are the states in which it's available. But, uh, but for today's, where we're concentrating on the, again, the Raleigh region from North Carolina up, you can see that we do have, uh, most of the region has this program available to it. Uh, so I'm going to start with two, I'm going to give you two quick cases to kind of show the advantages and some of the limitations of, of whole farm revenue or AGR light. First case, and everything's coming from Maryland, I just randomly picked one state in the region, uh, mostly also because I went to Maryland, gave a talk, so I had some of this data already together. And this is a very small farm, it's only 3.6 acres, uh, it's an organic farm, and it's growing uh, not an extreme diversity, but a fairly diverse, it has some beehives too. It's, I love beekeeping. As you said, I'm a beekeeper, so I put some beehives in there and uh, some livestock. Um, and then we have some laying hens, uh, so we have uh, egg production. And it's uh, uh, grossing about uh, 62400 And again, this is an example uh, made up. It, it's not a real farm, although the data I will use is based on some data that we've gotten from some farms in the region. Um, and again, I'm going to go through uh, showing how the, the premium is calculated, how this works out for them. I'm going to compare this to the non-insured program just to give you a sense of what alternatives they are. And I'm going to be using a loss scenario that's fairly significant, showing 50% loss on several of the crops uh, and even an 80% loss uh, due to, to uh, onion yield. Not unprecedented, uh, certainly, hopefully, doesn't happen to anyone, but it could. And this is a little bit about the non-insured crop. As I was saying, it's not technically a crop insurance product, uh, but you can find out about it through your crop insurance agent or through your farm service agency, FSA. Um, they, they are actually the people who run this program. It's kind of a natural disaster. It's a catastrophic kind of coverage. It's relatively inexpensive, uh, $250 per crop. And again, it's for non-insured crops. So, if you have fresh tomatoes and you want to insure your fresh tomatoes and there's no fresh tomato policy, which is pretty probable in, your, in this region, as you can see there's only a few counties with it, you could buy a NAP policy on your tomato and it would cost you 250 on your tomatoes and it costs you $250. And you could do that for several crops. It has a maximum payout, so depending on how many, the value of that, you, you, you know, if you have over $100,000 worth of tomatoes, it's not going to cover uh, past $100,000. It does, the fees can be waived for limited resource farmers. Again, that's a definition that to ask FSA or your crop insurance agent about. Uh, all crop, it would also does, um, this is a good, this requires good record keeping and crop notification could actually be, is valid for crop insurance as well as FSA uh, for this program. But it does mean you need to do that and sometimes you get problems because you need to like any kind of time, if there's a loss, you have to show the loss and you have to demonstrate that all the information you provided in the policy was correct. 
Uh, there are insurance, crop insurance adjusters, just like there's auto insurance adjusters that will, um, should you have a loss, you have to go through that. And probably the biggest reason people are interested in NAP is uh, in the 2008 Farm Bill now, to, there was a number of disaster assistance programs created. And one of the requirements for some of those disasters for, to be eligible for those, you need to have some kind of crop insurance uh, on your farm or on a crop. And uh, often this is the uh, an alternative, not the only one. And I'm going to use this wizard and show you some th some stuff about the wizard um, uh, right now. Uh, it's available in um, two different forms. I uh, unfortunately ran out of the CDs. We've been having a lot of demand for the CDs. You can actually load this tool right onto your own uh, personal computer. Uh, unfortunately, not a Mac version available. Uh, and we're going to get some new ones soon. Uh, we, we just run out uh, for the 2013 year. But you can also uh, utilize a tool that's online. And it does require a fairly good, at least fairly high speed, internet, good internet connection to work. But uh, I actually like it a little bit better. I'm going to hopefully, I'm going to use it today. Um, so I, I'm going to get out of here just briefly and go quickly to that to show you um, how this works. Ooh, I'm, yep, I know where I am now. Uh, there we are, AJ the Wizard. So if you would go to the AJ the Wizard website, this is what you get. Um, uh, it's a, it's um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it's a, it, it basically, here's the beginning. You can create it. You have to create an account. It's free, uh, but there's a little security behind it because you are putting in records here. So we have kind of a security system. It tells you the basic idea. Uh, you can read this later yourself. We don't have enough time to go through everything. And I'm just going to log in. Everyone now knows my username. Um, but they can't spell it. <laughs> anyway, let's log in. They always want to remember my password. Uh, here's a number of profiles. Now normally if I had come in for the first time I would actually, actually, as I set up the account, it would go through a, an eligibility. You remember, there's not available in every state. Uh, there are some limitations in terms of the maximum amount of coverage. And there's some other, other there's some obscure limitations. You have to be a farmer, you have to be a citizen, all of these things. And it will actually take you through an eligibility thing. It was very interesting when we created the, the tool. The farmer said, make sure we're eligible. We don't want to put any information in until we're eligible. So you would normally, I just did this so we could save some time. You go through the eligibility. Once the eligibility is, is done, then it always comes and brings you right here. And you can create as many profiles about as many different farms or variations on the theme that you want to do. And I've got some loaded from, from, from my historical use of this. And uh, we're going to be looking at mostly the, the Maryland organic and the Maryland wholesale uh, one, and I'll go there right now. So I've already done this uh, and loaded this profile, and then I can come back to it later. Normally, you would start uh, here. It's, as you can see, it has a very nice help system. It's actually based on the TurboTax idea. Uh, if you ever use TurboTax for your tax forms, you can locate an insurance. It has all this great other help. You can always ask for help. Uh, on the on the thing, and uh, it it's pretty, very very user friendly. This was widely tested over a couple of years. We went through a lot of work to make this as easy and uh, user friendly as possible. And so I'm going to um, go back to where we would normally start, and you would normally start at number one here. Um, but you see the red there because actually the way this works to calculate this what this does is calculate a premium for this policy for your farm based on your historical tax records that's how it works and unfortunately for 2013 you'd have to have tax records going back to 2007 and unfortunately this is one of the more difficult things about this uh, pro um, uh, this uh, product is that you have to have been farming since 2007 to apply for next to use it next year, so that's a big limitation for beginning farmers. I know there's some, been some effort and work in trying to figure out how we could make this available for uh, farmers with not that historical record. However, this is not that unusual. Um, uh, actual production history or yield insurance is also ba based on historical yield data. So uh, again, it's, it's very comparable in that sense. Anyway, you use your Schedule F, which is the typical way in which people. Um, 
have their tax information, but it can be adjusted to other tax forms if you're a limited liability corporation. It's more complicated then because you have to put everything in this format, but, but basically we did the Schedule F because that's what most people use. There's this whole thing about added value, and I'll show you that immediately. Unfortunately, it changed to Schedule F in 2011, so it's a little bit different for the 2011 year. Um, basically, what you come up with is you get your Schedule S back to 2007, you set them in a pile, and you go to line three, and if there's something in there, you put it right there. And then you go to line four. This, and then in line five. These are all possible ways to basically um, uh, the different sources of income that are possible that need to be evaluated. I'm not going to go into details, and you don't really know. It's just transparent. Again, just the logic is find line three, put it there. Find line four, put it there. This is the really important one, obviously, because this is the total sales or the revenue of the farm. And so this is for this farm that this this is this case study I example I'm putting on here. So you put the data in. Now the adjustment means. And this is another complication, unfortunately. If you were growing apples as one of your crops and you made apple cider, sometimes the apple cider value gets mixed up with the apples. Say you sell some apples and you make some apple cider with the apples. You have to take out the sales of the apple cider from this data. And that's complicated if you happen to be doing those value additive. And the logic here is that the apple cider is a business not a crop, and this is crop insurance, so it's only going to cover the growing of the apples, not the and uh, not the business of making cider, which you could get business insurance for. So that complicates things if you have to have that. But if you don't, in this case of this farm, it's not a, it's a big deal. So you enter the data, takes you to the next year. Again, you enter the data uh, for all of these years as you're going through. Um, it's probably the most time intensive part of it. Uh, but again, if you get all your Schedule F's in front of you, it's not too bad. Uh, and again, 2011 is a little bit different. You notice the lines changed a little bit differently. Um, anyway, I don't know why the Zimbra desk is top. Uh, okay, here we go. Anyway, so we got all the data in, and now we get the pretty pictures, which I love. So this is the farm's historic revenue over time. It says here's the average revenue. It's probably not untypical uh, of a lot of farms. And you can even have a larger graph if you want to look at the picture in the bigger. I'm just going to go to get through this. And here we are with, um, again, with, um, uh, now we have to go, now we're entering the production. This is the 2013 year. This is the intended production of this farm for this coming year. And remember, they were telling gate, they were doing kale, basil, beets, and eggs, and honey. And so this is the other intensive. So you have to put all this data in. So you add, and the way you would do this, you start, it would be blank, and you would start with adding a commodity. And you would pick from the commodities. These are actually, this is very, underlying this is the actual data from Maryland and Dorchester County. And these are the crops that they think can grow there. There's many of them, as you can see. If you're always, if there isn't one there, you can always use the other category. Uh, but you would essentially put in all the information about the crops. I'm not going to do that, and I've already done it for this farm, so we didn't spend the time doing. But I'll show you this first one for kale. Again, it didn't have kale, not too surprising as a commodity. But I put this is organic kale, and I, they use as bunches. Uh, there are actual different kinds of uh, quantity values here, but bunches isn't one of them. So I use bags as a kind of proxy for that. And they're $1.70 a bag for the kale, or a bunch, actually, in this case. And this is the acreage. These are yields, actually, that are viable in the Maine. This is from some data in Maine I got. And uh, this is only a 5 twentieths. Five hundredths of an acre or one twentieth is about a bed, one of those beds. Um, and again, I enter that in, and then the value is calculated. And here is the farm's value of all of its crops. Um, again, you can see we have eggs in there, 60 head, dozen eggs. You can uh, look at this. Um, you can play with this yourself when you get the tool. And the farm, as I said, is going to produce gross 62,400. Now we select the coverage level. Um, with most crop insurance, um, there are um, coverage level alternatives. Um, 
uh, again, the estimated age AGR is here uh, for the, again, it shows you, okay, the, here we are, the historic, and here's where we're going to be. You note that um, 2012 data isn't in there because usually you have to buy this policy by March 15th of the crop year, and most people haven't put their taxes in, so the way they got around that was to say, don't put your taxes in, your revenue information for 2012, just go right, uh, leave that out, and then you base the premium on the historic data going back from there. So the estimated um, AGR, the historic uh, kind of average, is 47,000. He thinks he's going to make 62,000. He's been on an upward 10. They have this index factor, which means they're giving them a little bit of credit than the straight average. Here's the straight average in this picture. This is the straight average of the farm. This is uh, historic, and this is the estimated AGR, which is slightly higher because, again, they give you this little bit of a trend, and that's because the idea is that you know, you could be, you know, you're, you think you're going to be way up here, you've been there last year, but the, the premium's based on kind of the historic average, as I said. And so let's go quickly to the next. So uh, this is the, this is a, I are not going to spend too much time here. This is a, you could actually mix and match insurances. So let's say you were growing field corn with all these other crops. You could actually insure your field corn with a special revenue policy and then cover the rest of the farm with a whole lot and that would actually with a whole farm revenue AGLI policy. And that would actually lower the cost because you would be uh, only insuring those fewer crops and, the, and, and be insuring the, the uh, corn separately. So you could mix and match. Um, and this is the place in which you would put the value of that insurance, which would then correspondingly uh, uh, lead to um, lead to uh, uh, you know a lower premium for for your AGR light part of it. This talks about the loss inception point, which is I'm again not going to read it. I'll show you graphically what that means, but it's basically the point at which you start to get paid once you've had a significant loss. This program runs on a little bit on like on a deductible. So in other words, you can have losses before you get any insurance, just like you with a car, you know, $500 deductible, if you break your windshield, it's $200. Insurance doesn't pay for the $200 until you've had $500 or more. It's very much the same with AGR Lite. Again, we're, we're moving towards the coverage level, and you have alternatives, so you could buy a lower level of coverage, and this gives you kind of a quick estimate of all the different levels, um, and they have two numbers here. You have the coverage level, which means 80% of your historic revenue is covered, if you choose this level, but you only get 90% of it paid. So in a way, and we'll talk about this later, is you only get effective coverage of about 72%, which is multiplying 80 times 90. So in other words, you could have a 28% loss of revenue before you start to see a dime from, from this policy, which is a pretty good deductible and one of the reasons. Um, this just gives you a description of how they come. And again, you can see here, that you actually are getting subsidy from the government that would have cost $1,700 to do that level of insurance normally in the normal market. And again, the government's paying that, but you do have to pay a fee. Everyone does. And this is what it would cost you to cover that farm, $926 uh, total for the year. Now we get the fun part, which I like, is to play, let's have a, a wipeout and let's, let's say what would happen if uh, my kale crashed or my beets uh, price crashed and what would the policy pay me if I had actually purchased it? You can create as many scenarios as you want. I uh, have one and we'll load it because it, um, again, to save time, and I'll call it big loss and uh, I'll load that scenario and it's already preloaded so it'll come up here hopefully. And there it is. And what I did is, again, remember if you went back to that slide, I talked about a, a loss scenario and where we had a crash of egg prices, uh, fetch, we had some loss to our organic corn here. Anyway, we've had all these different, so this is the, uh, you can see other vegetables, organic onions actually. I don't know why that drops off. That's something we need to fix actually. But I actually showing here that we had a, uh, 80% loss of yield, remember, on that, so a significant loss in the onions. Um, and so you put in this loss scenario, and then it kind of gives you this uh, uh, tabular data down here. So 
for this farm, we would have had a $1,928 loss payment for this level of, uh, of loss, which is significant loss. And probably the best way to see this is in viewing the graph of how it works. So again, here's the historic revenue of the farm. Farmer thinks he's going to be here. In fact, he has a significant loss below this estimated average. So really, he has a significant loss before the, the insurance is only paying that little bit amount when they go belong. This is this loss inception point they're talking about, going into the red. So they're really that 928 is not covering a significant amount of that loss, again, because this historic revenue is kind of pulling that down, and it's based on the historic revenue. So this is a big problem with it. A lot of people think it's not that good of a coverage. And I'll continue to the reports. You get these very nice reports at the end, um, many of them in the format that's ready for your um, uh, crop insurance, so you can see this. This is uh, an example. This way you would take and print this all out and take it to your crop insurance agent. And it's kind of like TurboTax in the same way. It fills everything out for you. It's very nice for the insurance agent to have this information. Again, all of it would have to be. And if you ever want to know where insurance agent is, that's also here as well. So I'm going to uh, uh, escape out of here right now and go back to my uh, presentation where I was where we left off. Full screen mode. All right. So here as I summarize the results um, of that AGR light case, uh, case one with a small farm. And again, uh, they, the premium would have been 1900, the losses paid would have been 1928. The premium was $956, as you might or may not recall. So the net payment after you paid your premium really would have been $972. You know, not a great payment for a significant amount of loss, but again, it's because of that effective coverage level that's not, not you know, you have a high deductible. However, if you would have bought NAP insurance for each of the products in this, it would have cost you 750 That's assuming the, the farm was in the same county, which it is, and it has more than three crops, so it maxes out at 750 premium. The problem, as you recall, uh, uh, with NAP is, NAP is really catastrophic protection. And it means that until you've had a 50% or more loss, the, this doesn't pay anything. The NAP program pays nothing. And then after you've had a 50%, it only pays 55 cents on the dollar for that loss that you do have calculated on a price that's established, and unfortunately not an organic price, established by FSA. So the payment, uh, Actually, you would only have gotten onions, and that would be a non-organic onion value for your losses after 50% loss and 55% of the value. And so you actually would have had a negative loss. It would have cost you more for the insurance than you would have got. So, so when AGRLI might be great, uh, NAP certainly is not his, his worst situation. And I think that's generally the case. I found if AGRLI is available and you have a number of crops um, and It'll probably give you a better level of coverage for the cost. Um, case two is a, a wholesale organic farm. And um, I want to give this an example because I want to actually uh, show this and can, if you would have bought it. Now, this is a more, this is a farm that's per, scaled up, let's say. It's a larger farm and it has, uh, again, in Maryland, again, and it's got organic sweet corn, fresh corn, but larger acreage. Um, a kind of specialized organic farm that's not doing quite as much diversity, but still a fair amount of diversity. And again, I'm going to do a loss scenario of 50% yield or price loss on all of these crops. And I'm going to compare this to buying individual policies um, for, and in these cases, only yield would be, yield insurance would be available for these at their non-organic, and compare what would happen if that were, were the case. And um, I'm going to escape really quick and go to that. Um, and we'll come back to this summary chart to show you uh, what haps, happened there. And I'm going to go back to my AGR light, which I'm still on. And I'm going to go back to, I'm going to load a different profile now of that farm. So, which is the cool thing about having all these saved. And this is the Maryland wholesale clays, I call it. Wholesale vegetable, let's say. Again, the larger thing. Uh, I'm not going to go through the... Uh, I'm going to actually just go right here to the loss scenario. Again, you would have done, here's, a, here's the kind of summary data here. You uh, have the green peas, the apples, the sweet corn, 
uh, and we're you know I put all that data again, and we're going to just load again that 50% loss here. Um, and I've got that say again another big loss scenario. Again, you can name as many scenarios as you want for this, and I'm going to load that. And we're going to really look at the graph, which I think is the most important, and more interesting thing to see here. But again, this is a significant loss, 50 cents, 50% 50 across the board, whether, whether yield or, 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 or uh, price related. And this loss payment would be significant, $57,000. Again, um, let's view the graph because, again, you can see. So what I did here is, again, this is the expected estimated AGR is historic. This is what they were thinking they were going to get this year if you add those up. And uh, let's view the graph. It really does help. I'll explain that better. It's, in fact, let's look at the larger graph just because it can give a little bit bigger view of this. So in this case, the Maryland farm, the big wholesale farm, again, he had an erratic revenue. His, uh, rev his average was here. Now you can see, again, because of this uh, scale kind of makes us look a little bit funny because of the scale on this side. It looks, it looks wider than it would in the other case. But again, this is where the farmer thought he would be in 2013. This is where he, in fact, ended up. Pretty bad case scenario, 50% loss across everything. And because he, again, was trending up, the estimate age ARL is higher than just the near average. But again, he has to suffer this amount of loss before the loss inception starts to pay out. This is the deductible, and then it starts to pay out all the way up to there. But again, um, and again, again, and this is historic uh, revenue. So again, you can, you can play with uh, different scenarios and, and go back. Again, I'm going to put that down, and I'm going to come back here and uh, back to the summary of this. And this, I think, is, is the most, one of the more interesting things in this case uh, for Maryland is if this farmer had purchased uh, individual policies for sweet corn, fresh market tomatoes, green peas, apples, which fortunately in Dorchester County, Maryland, were available, um, he, could, uh, he or she could have uh, and experienced this kind of yield loss. Um, and I ba Now, here's a critical point. I used 100% price selection, which means they're getting the full projected price, and that's how they de determine yield loss on a, price, on a futures price at 70% of that approved yield. Now, uh, one of the benefits of individual policies is that you can get a higher level of coverage than 70% of the approved yield. In many cases, you can go as high as 85%. I only use 70% in this case because I wanted it to be somewhat comparable to AGR Lite, which in its maximum can only provide 72% of the whole farm's revenue. So this is comparable, but I want to know, make, make sure that you could have bought and it would have costed you more, but you could have bought higher level coverage for each of these individual crops if you wanted to. The point point here, for the kind of equal level of coverage, the premium would be significantly higher to buy individuals, $24,000 actually to buy individual policies for each of these. And I'll tell you in doing this, the fresh market tomato is the most risky and the most costly individual policy, and you can check that out on your own if you want to. Uh, and uh, but 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 nonetheless, it's significantly cost. The losses paid, if they would have had this 50% yield, are actually lower than if it would have AGR light. So really, the net payment in this case would have been higher. Now, part of the advantage again of AGR light is I'm incorporating the organic value of these crops, whereas in this case, I'm only using the, the conventional or non-organic crops value. So. Again, but it's a fairly, again, the trigger point is important. There is that deductible before you get to those losses. But in this particular case, the farmer would have actually done better with HR Light. And it makes a little bit of sense if you think about it because we're pooling the risk across several farms. So to summarize, and we'll get to some questions now, whole farm revenue policy can work well for diverse and specialty crops and organic too, which is just in some sense a form of specialty cropping, if, particularly if there's no other option available, particularly if there's many crops that farmers grow which they just can't get individual policies in their specific locations. So it's a good, and unfortunately you can only get it in 38 states, so it's not even available to everyone everywhere nationally. But where it is available, it's a very, very valid alternative. Um, 
single crop producers, if you were only growing maybe corn or soybeans, probably corn or soybeans would be a better deal than um, than AGR light. Although we saw again with if you're um, actually what happens is if you don't have at least three different commodities. You, you don't get the higher level of coverage. So you have to grow at least three to get the higher level of, uh, of coverage with AGR light. So make sure you're growing at least three things. But I would always check it out. If, if you're growing three things that can't be covered in another way, um, then, um, then uh, it's, a, you know, it's valuable, to, um, it's valuable to, uh, to look at AGR light, I would uh, argue. Uh, and again, the level tr is relatively low. Uh, it's only 72%. And remember, I said on certain individual policies, you can get 85% of the yield rather than 70% of the whole farm. So again, if you want a higher level of coverage, it'll cost you more, but it will give you a better coverage. And you there is a limit to the coverage that AGR provides. So I think if they really wanted to make this pr uh, product uh, uh, more successful, I think they, they should consider raising that level of coverage closer to the 85% that you could get for an individual crop, and I think there would be a lot more people using it. I think it's a rather high deductible, in other words, as far as it goes right now. So that's some of the summary there. Uh, if I didn't make any sense to you all today, uh, we have a great publication which finally just came out, uh, which gives a, a other examples from around the country, and uh, I think it's a great uh, publication. Of course, I wrote it, but <laughs> anyway, um, you, uh, that's why it's so great. No, um, just kidding, but it, it's a great publication. I think it goes through this a little bit slower than perhaps I did today, and it's, uh, it's available by calling our 1-800 number there or uh, just calling uh, or getting online and looking at it at our after site. Okay, Rich, uh, do you have any questions? I'll be happy to take them. Okay, Jeff, thanks. Um, first question says that this uh, AGR light seems to be set up for market gardens that sell crops individually. Uh, what about farmers that market through CSA either in part or exclusively and lose a percentage of total volume in a season or maybe lose a percentage of total deliveries? Yeah, it's a, it probably, it really does not work well for CSAs for a number of reasons. I mean, I've gotten this question many times. And the reason I say that is, is that CSAs are fundamentally set up. I know there are farms that are both CSAs and then market sellers at the same time. And that it gets even more confusing. I don't even know. And I would go to the insurance agent and RMA. I mean, if you could insure that part of the farm that isn't dedicated to CSA with an AGRLA policy, it, the, the problem with the CSA, of course, is one, they're usually very diverse, sometimes 40 different crops. And if you remember filling out that form, you'd have to form out 40 different crops, you know, and that would be pretty laborious. Uh, the other thing is, is that what is the market price for that, the price, the intended price for the crop year? That gets mixed up in a share price, usually. You know, CSAs are noted because they buy, they buy a fixed basket of many different crops over a long, over the entire crop year for a one price. And you, it gets very confusing to try to break that out to each of those individual crops you're giving in a basket. Fundamentally, I don't see it working very well for CSAs, unfortunately. Um, I know CSA is a very popular way to get started farming and it's a popular way. I, I, I just don't see how it would easily work with the CSA. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, personally, I think it it just doesn't work well because of the nature of CSAs themselves. Wish I had a better answer, or, or at least a nicer answer. Okay. Um, the next uh, question is, when producers use the tool, the AGR Light Wizard, to load estimated yield and price uh, for 2013, does the producer use his or her own yields and prices? Yes, it would be based on their historic expectation of that. Now, I don't know if you, I didn't point it out very carefully, and when you get the tool or look at the tool online, you'll see some of the, these details. Um, all insurance, crop insurance, has this uh, ability to be manipulated, let's say, and there and there's a certain, um, protections that we have to be, be, be in there if people aren't trying to gaming the system. And this is one of the areas where it could be, you will note that if you do not have 
at least 70% of your normal expenses in a normal year associated with your intended year, there can be discounts and some issues with that because the basic idea is that if you're not actually trying to produce, then you're just trying to collect on the insurance. Of course, that would be fraud and, and they have to be questioned. It. So they would be looking at if you got to the point where you're getting a, a you know, a, a going through crop insurance adjustment and you're collecting on an AGLA policy, they're going to look at your expenses for that crop year uh, as well. And they're going to look at that historical data upon which you base that intended price. So it is your price based on your historical best estimate at the time that goes in there. Now, I've never been through a, an adjustment of a AGR light, and I haven't done it. And it would be—it's more difficult than uh, than simpler yield insurance. But there would also be probably some questioning about whether that intended price was in fact. But in a way, it doesn't really matter because the premium and the coverage is really based on historic data that is in fact real and based on your insurance. So that data, historic data, is real and verifiable. And the intended production is verifiable too in the sense that you have sales records and can justify that price. So yes, it's your prices that you intend to get for those crops or livestock products for that matter. Alrighty, the, the next question would be, um, I heard that if a particular crop-based policy is not available in your county or state that you can request that are to make a request to RMA to use it in your county or state. Is this true? Yeah, it's true. Um, and I, I, I briefly alluded to it in the presentation. Um, uh, there's a fact sheet. You can call us about it or email me, and I can get, get your copy. You can get it off the RMA website. It's a process, though. Um, if, you're, if, say, you were uh, wanting to insure your fresh market tomatoes in your county and the neighboring county did have fresh market, that would probably be a relatively easy case because you would basically say, look, they have it right across the county line. Why can't can it apply? You would have to go through a process to apply, get a waiver from RMA to do that. And if it was very close, it's likely. Now, if you're farther away in an area where there's not historically been a lot of fresh market tomatoes grown, Although, like for instance, we grow them here in Montana, despite our cold weather, um, you know, there's none available <laughs> within states around us, much less in counties, for fresh market tomatoes. You would have a harder. You'd have to make a case. You'd have to say, "I've grown them. I can show I can grow them. I can show here's my yield." I, and you'd have to go through a very extensive process. So, point of fact is, yes, it's available, but it's a rather and it's not a guaranteed process, it's a process where you're going to have to defend them allowing you to use that policy in a county in which they have very limited data. Again, RMA and, and the private companies un, that, that do this have to be actuarially sound by law. And part of the reason they're not available in all those counties is that they haven't done the work to determine the actuarial soundness of fresh market tomatoes everywhere in the country. Okay, um, I believe we have time for one more question, which is, why is AGR light not available in all states? How do we get AGR light in the remaining 12 states? My flippant answer was ask RMA. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I get this question a lot, and, and it's, it goes a little bit first back to that actuarial data problem. Um, many of the, when they, for instance, I just learned this actually, over for quite recently, when AGR Light was established in Wisconsin and in Illinois, there was actually a, quite an effort by the Department of Agriculture in those states, by some producers in those states that produced horticulture crops or, or diverse crops. They worked with some insurance agents. They worked with RMA. They had to do a lot of collection of data to provide actual soundness. Uh, some information about all the different crops that potentially could be used so they could get some sense of the risk involved in providing that insurance. And they worked that through for Illinois. And in fact, the guy uh, was on the, uh, uh, that I talked to actually was one of the guys who was really instrumental in leading that. And they just simply, for instance, didn't lead that effort in Iowa. Uh, so, you know, it, 
there was some intention. And initially, it was a pilot project. It moved to several states. There was a lot of work to create it. It's really disappointing to me. For instance, I think states like California could really use it. Texas could really use it. But really, everywhere could use it because we're having a growing local regional food system where we're getting more, a lot more of these diverse, smaller, even medium-sized farms producing a lot more vegetables and diversity. And in, in states like Iowa, even you know, Iowa doesn't only grow corn and soybeans. It does grow a lot of vegetables and other crops that could be insured. And it would be nice to have AGR light there as well, or AGR for that matter. And so it's, it's time, effort, work that needs to be done. And uh, like everything else, it's, a, it's a squeaky wheels, uh, you know, get, the, get things moving. So get with your friends and call RMA and, and figure out if you can do it. Um, it's, it's a resource issue too. Okay, well, thanks, Jeff. That's uh, that's all the time we have. Um, I'd like to remind the listeners again that the webinar will be posted in the next few days on the ATRA website at www.atra.incat.org. And also, I want to remind you that we will get back to you uh, with about any questions that you send in that weren't answered during the webinar um, via email. And also, if other questions occur to you, you know, as you're mulling this over after the webinar, um, please call either our ATRA hotline, which is there on your screen, or go to the ATRA website and use the Ask an Ag Expert function. And you can, you know, send in a question that way and it will, and we'll, and we'll get it to Jeff. And remember that the, those hotlines that you see on the screen and the Ask an Ag Expert, um, they're free services and they're always available for your questions about sustainable agriculture. And while you're, if you do go to the ATRA website, maybe to do the Ask an Ag Expert, uh, check out our other webinars. We have quite an archive there of webinars and, and we have more than 400 publications on sustainable agriculture and a lot of other features there. And finally, I also want to remind our viewers once again to take a few minutes to complete the survey that you'll see come up on your screen um, immediately after we close here. So once again, thanks, Jeff.